housing challenges Canada continues to face have many social implications and will continue, if not worsen, unless we find ways to meet the growing housing demands. With us today is Barry Springwater, Oral Medante MPP, and Ontario Attorney General Doug Downey to discuss the goals and efforts of the province on the issue of housing affordability and availability. How are you today? I'm great, Mike. Thanks for having me on, and Arif. It's uh, looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, and thank you for coming on to the show. We do appreciate this. So let's start out with the main question. Just how serious is our housing situation in Ontario and what impacts do we face if this isn't corrected? Well, it, it's very serious and we're, we're playing catch up to some degree because we haven't had the, the, the progress at the, at the rate that we need it over the last number of years. It's causing prices to go up, uh, not mm-hmm. just housing prices. It's causing rental prices to go up. Uh, short supply is affecting everybody. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, and, it's, it is a huge it is a huge question. I don't think it's one that's faced only in in Ontario. It's it's certainly south of the border as well. There was a period not so long ago where where they were literally developers south of the border were doing buy one get one free, and now um, and, and now that's that's nowhere to be seen. One of the things that that comes to mind though with me is that you know the the entire term around affordability what does that mean and to who i mean by whose gauge are we using certainly the existing definition uh, whether it's federally or provincially i would consider to be maybe also behind the times a little bit outdated well i i, I look at what i would have been able to afford coming out of school uh, what i was able to afford or not afford and and i look at uh, younger people coming up through the system people who want to buy their first home um quite frankly people who are staying in their homes longer because yeah. the cost of moving to another uh, type of housing is, is also increased. So it's having a cascading effect all the way through and everybody's feeling it. Everybody's talking about it. It's so, so severe. I want to bring this up though, Mike, just because I want to actually throw this, uh, I want to, I want to put you a little bit on the spot, Mike. And, and that is that as a realtor and part of somebody who's part of the industry associations, lobby associations that aspires as an organization to meet with politicians, et cetera. We often, from my perspective, we often wonder uh, whether it's federally or provincially, those who are making legislation or policy, how well connected are they uh, in the conversation before that policy is actually introduced? How, um, what kind of professional guidance are they getting from industry people? Um, well, we do provide our insights for sure, and we meet with uh, our federal and provincial uh, government uh, um, on an annual basis, and we're, we're always uh, sending updates to, uh, to different government officials. Um, but oftentimes when we do see policy put down, we scratch our heads and wonder, well, was there any consultation? And this morning's a perfect example, uh, reading the paper, uh, British Columbia is now looking to implement uh, a cooling off period, meaning you could put an offer in on a home and you could opt to get out of that uh, over a period of time after, which totally puts a kibosh in the whole system because you sell a home um that leaves you in a position to turn around and buy your next home but if suddenly there's these conditions that allow you to get out at any time then the the whole system falls apart so this is what i've been seeing is measures put in place to kind of slow and stifle um market activity when the root of it is demand and supply and we need more supply and I'm, i'm happy to see that the government is aware of this in ontario and is looking to see how we can remedy this. Uh, so, Doug, Doug, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, obviously, you are working on an initiative right now, and we're glad to have you on the show. And I know that you're working uh, daily since the day you were uh, uh, sworn in to to improve efficiency, make access to things uh, as an attorney general to the legal system, to justice. But this also falls under your jurisdiction as well, cutting red tape and housing. So maybe uh, let us know, what are you up to? Look, we have to, Mike's absolutely right. I mean, you can't come in with, with new fancy ideas if the context isn't right or if, if it's not practical. And, and you only get the practical if you talk to people who actually do it. And, and you have to have an understanding when you move a piece in the system, how it's going to affect the other parts. That's what we have to get at. We have to get at the processes. We have to get at the rules. We have to get at the structure so that we're structurally changing things in a logical way that's going to make a difference. And we need supply. I mean, yeah. There, there are those who, who think that we can do other things to solve the problem. We want yeah. immigration. We want workers. We want people here, uh, and they want a place to live. We have to have a way to grow the, the population in, in a way that they can afford the housing. 
yeah. and yeah, that's our core challenge. You bring that up, Doug, and and uh, I, I think quite rightly so. I, I love that you said it, though, and I'm glad that it's coming from you that you said uh, we, and that was whether you're at a federal, provincial, or a municipal level, for some reason, look around the entire challenge for other ways that we can do. How can we add another layer? How can we add another bylaw? How can we add, add another level of complexity instead of addressing something that, you know, I mean, quite frankly, Mike and I have been discussing this for a number of years now, supply is the issue. It's simple. You can get down to the fundamental levels. It's about supply. So what what can we do? You hear about some of the challenges that those who are, whether they're developers or single homeowners who are looking to maybe add another suite to their property. And instead of having a blanket policy that says, if you check these boxes, you can shortcut the system or bypass, you know, steps one through five and get right into the heart of it. You know, applicants are still finding themselves, uh, their hands tied by the existing procedure. I would, I would ask a rhetorical question uh, that we all know the answer to it, Are people frustrated by the process? The, of course, the answer is yes. There are people who would add supply that won't even enter the process because they've seen the frustration of others. Mm -hmm. So we've got a backlog uh, angst that is causing people not to even come to market, let alone the things that you look at that are on the books that are not moving. And they're not moving within a reasonable time at all. We can talk more about what that process is when, when somebody raises their hand with a bit of an objection and where that takes a project. But yeah, it's, we've got a systemic problem that we need mm -hmm. to start taking out parts. Well, let, let's talk about that a little bit uh, with regards to new uh, development, especially within urban centers. Um, when there is resistance from re within the community, and more often than not, there is some resistance. Sometimes it's a vocal few um, purporting to speak on behalf of the many, um, but with Internet, it's hard to know. Is it two voices? Is it 2,000 voices that are speaking here? And that's often confusing. What is the process uh, that we go through at the, the municipal level if there's an approval and then it wants to be challenged? It, it does end up coming to the provincial level. So what happens once it reaches that level? Yeah, well, it all starts back and we can get into it in the, in the next part, but it starts with the official plan and the zoning bylaws and all the pieces that allow people to engage with the system and then how they engage and what happens from there. So I think that that's a great segue, Mike. Let's actually go to break real quick. Uh, it's almost like you've done this before, Mr. Attorney General. Uh, you know what? This is a great conversation. I don't know if we're going to solve the entire crisis in the next uh, uh, four, 14, 15 minutes, but we're glad to have you on our show. We are talking about how do we uh, make the process more efficient and, and allow for more supply to enter the market to address housing, housing affordable affordability crisis. Wow. And that is a perfect uh, place to take a break real quick. Uh, we will be right back with more from the Attorney General for Ontario, as well as the MPP for Barry Springwater or Medante Doug Downey right after this break. Welcome back to Hitting Home. We're glad you're with us. We're joined by MPP Doug Downey, who represents Barry Springwater Oro Medante, as well as the, uh, being the Attorney General. And we are in the middle of a segment talking about process and inefficiency and whether you're a, a developer coming in with a large scale plan or whether you're a single homeowner, uh, there is often frustration uh, that is uh, 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 you know, facing the, the applicant. And Doug, a question for you. I mean, literally, this is something that I've been saying for a while now. We either are committed to addressing the challenge or we're not. We either have the political will to do what is either popular or seemingly unpopular, or we don't. And I think that that is uh, at the root of the challenges, if we make a decision, you know, do we get reelected? Well, I, I think part of the, the challenge is that we don't really have a choice anymore. We're, we're at a spot where there's been so much inaction over the years. And as, as you know, I was, a, I was a real estate lawyer for 20 years, helping people uh, buy their homes and, and move and, and saw some of the challenges, saw the cycles, uh, saw some of the, the escalating costs of, of doing business, of building mm -hmm. a home. Uh, so I, I think we're in a spot now where we really have to move and we're, we're seeing uh, some areas where we'll do a, a ministerial zoning order, an MZO, and that will unlock a project, everything from, from retirement homes to, uh, to urban development to, well, rock and roll because the Rolling Stones played because an MZO was issued. But we have other 
we have some municipalities that want to cling to their red tape and their processes, and they on principle will oppose an NZO, or they on principle will oppose some piece of red tape. <clears throat> and that's not, we, we can't, we have to punch through that. We have to be able to unlock supply. Um, there's no other answer. We can't stop people from living in homes. Well, we do have people who uh, will quite um, um, be, be quite committed to attending a council meeting or attending a public meeting where a plan of application is being presented, and and they are, you know, career deputants basically to to say no to something. And you know, I, I remember well, we both served on council, and and I remember walking out uh, from from uh, the the uh, councilors' lounge into the chamber and seeing a, a, a packed auditorium, packed being 200 people. And I remember colleagues at some times, you know, referring to how, well, we must have, we must have gotten on somebody's nerve. We, there are some angry people out there. There are maybe some bed sheets and some posters that are saying, you know, stop this or stop that. And we have to look at each other and say, there are 200 people here. Yes, absolutely. But there are 149,800 people who are not here and we represent all of them. And what are your thoughts when you have a, a vocal smaller group but 200's a lot. I mean, you imagine people protesting outside your office. If there's 30 of them, that's a bad press day. Well, I, look, I want people to have pride of place. I want people to have pride of home and, and, and be in an area and a neighborhood that, that they choose to be. And I think that they have to have voices heard. I think people, quite frankly, I, people will give insight and you go, oh, I didn't think of that, right? There will be some piece of the puzzle. Um, but that doesn't stop everything. Uh, necessarily, because we have to be looking out for uh, for the overall growth with, with a plan. And that's where council, is, that's the big job is doing the planning, the outward years planning, uh, making sure that we're doing things. But look, we, it's no surprise. Uh, we all know Barry is rent. Rental rates are, I think we're third highest in the country at this yeah. point. Um, that's has a big impact on the, the ability to attract people, uh, the ability to grow. And, and I think we, we just have to do something about that. Yeah. So, Mike, a question for you, Mike. You, you had mentioned, we talked about this before, it could take 3, 5, 10, 15 years to get a larger scale uh, development through the, the hurdles and the red tape and finally to get a shelf on the ground. Meanwhile, there is an option, and you touched on it in the last segment about, about second suites. Mike, what are your thoughts? Yeah, well, it, it's something I've been pushing for years, and I was happy to see the, you know, the province make changes that would you know, put the decision of... Uh, second suites back in the hands of the municipality and uh, um, Barry is going forward with that. Uh, there are hurdles along the way and there is resistance to second suites, but the reality is um, there is enough square footage of real estate uh, within existing housing stock that we could house a lot of the, the people who are in need of affordable housing uh, uh, within, the, within the, the city of Barrie. And I would say the same happens in other urban centers. And what I would like to see is more incentives, less red tape for sure, for those people who would like to uh, create a second suite within their home, but financial incentives, if they could come from, from any and all levels of government, um, that would uh, help people. Because as I see going forward, if you're a young family looking to buy into your first home, um, a lot more of those people are not going to be able to do that without some sort of financial uh, assistance that having a second suite would provide for. So, um, and if you can move some of those people from the rental market into, into ownership, that frees up housing stock. If they then create that second suite, there's more opportunity for rental accommodation there. So I think it's undertapped, and I think uh, there's a lot more that the various levels of government can do to encourage and stimulate uh, that going forward. Your thoughts on that, Doug? Yeah, I, I think when people think about second suites, they, they have this image of student ghettos, right? They, they assume that it's going, and they'd be surprised actually how many people uh, have, you know, a, a separate entrance uh, uh, in a neighborhood. So it usually manifests itself in, in, uh, in a small group of negative, whether it's people parking on front lawns. And so it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's how the place is managed, not what it is. Yeah. And, exactly. and I, look, I, I lived in, in a basement uh, for years going to school uh, mm -hmm. in a neighborhood and nobody would know that students were there. Uh, we just came and went and, and that was fine. So I, I think we have to understand how it can operate and, and then build our infrastructure around that. Maybe we need some extra parking at the end of a neighborhood. 
Maybe we need some extra pieces to make it work. But you're right. The footprint is there. Uh, yeah. We're only making so much land, so we, we need to make the best use of it. Yeah. And one other area that uh, I, I think shows potential, too, is there's a lot of brownfield uh, uh, sites within urban centers right across the province. Uh, Bradford Street and Barrie is the perfect example. And brownfields, for those who don't know, is uh, sites that are deemed as contaminated uh, that need soil remediation before any residential can be built on them. And it's costly. It's a very expensive process, uh, the testing that needs to be done. And if you have to go to phase two and, and remove that soil, the costs are even higher. And that's why so much of that land with great potential for residential sits undeveloped. And what typically happens if, if a developer does want to develop one of those sites, they go to the city uh, with a proposal and typically they're trying to extend beyond what the zoning uh, restrictions are. And they need to add more housing or more units in order to cover those uh, costs. And more often than not, those proposals are shot down or they can't find a middle ground. And so that property sits for another 10, 15 years before the next uh, person tries to bring it forward. Uh, do, you, do you see opportunity there that the province could maybe get involved in that would, would see some of that brownfield uh, um, opportunity? Yeah, I, I, I think there's great, there's great opportunity in terms of creating stability and predictability. Uh, and, and doing it in a timely way, because I, I think Eric mentioned earlier about how long it takes, three, five, 10 years. Well, for yeah. somebody who's trying to do a project, they have money tied up in that. And that's money that's not being used in, in the market. It's just parked, just waiting. And it's very hard to predict uh, what's going to happen three and five and 10 years from now with the project. And it's causing a, a real hesitation in people investing in things like Brownfield. They're going to take a bit more work uh, to, yeah. to do it properly. Yeah, so we do have to go to break. And this is a great conversation. And I love just sit, sitting and listening uh, to the back and forth. I think there's plenty more to do. What I'd like to do and to get in the, in the third uh, uh, segment is to discuss what it is that you uh, and, and your colleagues, your peers, your advisors have planned for Ontario going forward and, and uh, how industry uh, might be able to help, how locals might be able to help. What is it that you need to be able to do your job effectively? So I'll let you think on that for a moment while we go to break, but uh, stay with us, please, for the final segment with uh, Doug Downey when we come back from this break on Rogers TV. back to hitting home with Mike and RF and uh, Attorney General Doug Downey, MPP uh, as well for Barry Springwater or Medante. Thanks for being with us on here. Lively conversation, good conversation. We uh, were just touching on Brownfield and uh, how Brownfield, the cost associated with remediating uh, Brownfield properties has been prohibitive, both in policy as well as expense. And, and, you know, topic for further conversation maybe, but how can we get involved as a province, as taxpayers, and look at this as an opportunity and investment, not just for today and the expense that a developer might face today that is prohibitive, but look at it actually uh, from a ecological, from an environmental, from a, a generational perspective. Uh, final thoughts on that one before we switch gears a little bit. I think on Brownfield, sometimes time takes care of things and you need to, you need to start the process now so that it's ready down the road, some longer term planning for, for that stuff. I, uh, the rules uh, were set back when Toronto wanted the, the Olympics and then uh, they weren't, then they were not really flushed out for three years after that because Toronto didn't get the Olympics. Anyways, we could have a whole show on that. Uh, there's challenges there, but we have to reclaim the brownfield. Something to think about, though, I mean, you know, they say that when you put something on title, it runs with the land. Well, is there, and we use buzzwords like collaboration all the time, but do we mean it? Is there an opportunity for the province or municipalities to collaborate with existing landowners that may or may not run with the land? So if there is an obligation, it stays tied to the property, but makes it more pal palatable to be able to go and redevelop a brownfield. Sorry. Yeah, I, I think depending on the particular property, there's there's an ability to uh, to put covenants on to to restrict certain to protect forests areas uh, to to do different things, and and I think there's lot lots of room there. We also have look, the province has a big inventory of land. All, all municipal governments, uh, school boards, uh, uh, everybody has some. I think we have to have a look at at what we're doing there. And the best example locally is uh, working with the county. On Rose Street, uh, the OPP uh, detachment there, um, you know, that's it's moving pretty quick because uh, 
because we want it to move fairly quick. We we want to use the land. And you want to use it for, for residential uh, with an affordability element in there, if I understand right. That's right. And, and that's where the county comes in, fine, using, using that partnership. Mm-hmm. I, I think that that is fantastic. I know the premier did touch on this uh, during his uh, original election uh, period, and, and he did talk about the fact that there was surplus and that there is underutilized properties. Now we're also finding ourselves, COVID has happened, it's affected everybody. We're working more and more from home. Is there a reason why we cannot uh, sort of shift gears and allow for not urban sprawl, but otherwise lesser attractive areas, if you will, that have not been so tied to the GTA, can we not be um, redeploying our efforts and shifting our focus to make those other areas that are farther outlying from the GTA more attractive for development, economic development, settlement, investment, et cetera? Yeah, so what we need is infrastructure. We need we need the, the roads to, to still allow people to come and go when they need. And you're seeing that with the Bradford Bypass and, and, and others. We need infrastructure like broadband, which our government has, has invested four billion dollars uh, with a plan, and it's in motion. It's actually happening. Uh, we're seeing different companies get their bids in, and, and we'll see that expand because people need connectivity, uh, absolutely. And yeah. and we want to make sure that that the neighborhoods are the type of neighborhoods that people want to live in. Uh, yeah. Like I say, they're not just sprawl, but they're actually communities. Yeah, and as that uh, broadband becomes more readily available throughout the province, not just within big urban centers, I think we see the opportunity for for a lot of our commerce and a lot of our business to not be tied to those big urban centers, but be able to spread out. And that includes uh, government uh, services as well. Um, it'll take time, and a lot of it's a mindset thing, and a lot of it is actually implementing the inf- infrastructure as well. But uh, are are you optimistic that we will? You know, the province of Ontario uh, will look quite different 10, 15 years from now than it does today in those regards. Yeah, I, I think we need to. And I'm a big personal proponent. This isn't government policy, but I'm a big personal propo- uh, proponent of uh, spreading out government services. So when you look at the OPP headquarters in Aurelia and what that's done economically for the area, mm-hmm. uh, the, the, the impact is proportionally larger than it would be if we just put it, you know, in a large urban center. And, mm-hmm. and uh, it was just one more thing there. Yeah, yeah, so I'm, I'm thinking, though, I, I'm remembering, I believe it was Elliot Lake, I'm not positive, I don't want to speak out of turn, but they were the ones who said, hey, we'll take the nuclear waste, you know, it'll, uh, and, and, it might, and if, if it's a different municipality, please let me know, but they said, you, nobody else wanted it, and they said, no, no, we'll do it, we'll do it right, and by the way, we'll, we'll have a bunch of jobs that pay six-figure incomes, you know, that's the type of thinking that I think is fantastic, I'm not suggesting that we all get into nuclear waste, but uh, what is it that we can do, what is it that the province can say to municipalities that says, you know what, the old school municipal act and the way we've had our minds set is, is, is outdated. Here's how we can work together. What, what kind of guidance and, and encouragement do you have for the local community? Yeah, I, look, I, I can tell you, Minister Steve Clark, Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, he, he was the youngest mayor in his time. He was the president of VEMO. He's engaged with municipalities uh, constantly. And we have tables where we talk about different things. So if it's uh, in my world and it's something like uh, uh, POA reform or alcohol reform, whatever, uh, we go to the MO table. I think the, the ongoing discussion, the, the, the room for that is really where we start and, and make sure that we're, we're aligned with our you know, municipal, county, uh, provincial, federal, and get the best bang for the buck for the taxpayer. Do you think you know, there is a point in our future, in our lifetime, where we will see supply catch up with demand? Uh, and maybe that's a way to wrap this up uh, uh, or come towards wrapping this up today. Uh, are, are we on track for that? You got 30 seconds, sir. <laughs> I'm just going to say this. Look, the government that you vote for matters. There are different paths we can take. And we're on a path to success right now. Yeah. Awesome. I love that attitude. I think that's a great way to, to wrap it up. It certainly is a government that has spent uh, the last uh, several years saying, we're not just talking about doing it. This is something that we're doing. This is something that is an action. And uh, listen, certainly appreciate your willingness to come to come out and, and speak with us, speak with the community by extension. Uh, any, any contact info that you want to share or any invitation you want to share to the public to give feedback? Yeah, office is open. Love to hear from anybody, good, bad, or otherwise. Awesome. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Attorney General and MPP, Doug Downey. It's fantastic to have you on the show. And we'll see you again on Hitting Home with Mike and Arthur.